We came to a little calumet, pink and black threads. I don't believe Myrtle really met to gather driftwood that summer day. Charles and I had to leave the island to go to Syracuse on business. I'm sure she just went for a boat ride in Browns Bay. However, when she saw that wood lying around, she just couldn't resist its invitation. She piled the boat high with her salvage and rowed back to our island dock. Instead of leaving it for the children to unload, she finished this task. Being tired by that time, she wasn't very cautious. That was her undoing. She stepped upon a rusty nail protruding from one of the boards. When we arrived back from the city, Myrtle said nothing about her accident. I was soon engaged in preparing dinner, so I didn't notice her unusual silence. Customarily, she would have been inquiring about the day's happenings in Syracuse. Just as I was about to put the food on the dining room table, she showed me her foot, saying it hurt terribly. It was a very angry red and swollen. When I found out her wound had happened in the morning, I was horrified at the length of time she had gone without attention. Chuck forgot about eating and rushed her to the E.G. Noble Hospital in Alexandria Bay. There, the doctor administered a tetanus shot and a sedative. Upon mother's arrival back at Holiday Island, she wanted to go immediately to bed for a while. She would eat later. I settled her in her room and soon she was fast asleep. After an hour or so, Myrtle awakened to ask for food and some of the strawberry Kool-Aid we had for our evening meal. She seemed all right, said her foot was a hurting just then, and asked me to leave the Kool-Aid on her bedside table. It was dark outside when I began to wash the dishes. A loud thump on the floor above me set my nerves to quivering. Had Mother fallen? I grabbed the kerosene lamp and ran up the stairs. Mother's dog, Brownie, was outside her door in the hall. The wretched animal didn't seem to recognize my face behind the lighted lamp. She planted her feet in front of me, bared her teeth, and growled a warning low in her throat. It was bad enough to fear Myrtle had fallen out of bed without this complication. No way could I get past that dog or seem to quiet her. I called to Mother to summon Brownie, but heard only a low moan. By this time, the commotion brought Donna, Tony, and Kay out of their bedrooms. They began to cry. In desperation, I grabbed a broom sitting nearby, reassured the children all would be well. I hit Brownie with a broom and backed her into a corner. The surprise attack let me get past her into Mother's room. I slammed the door shut behind me to keep the dog out. Mother lay face down in a lengthening red pool. Frightened, I screamed for Chuck just then, coming up the path from the boathouse. When he raised Myrtle up from the floor, we found that she had fallen on the Kool-Aid glass she had knocked to the floor while trying to get out of the bed. There was a nasty looking gash in her leg, the Kool-Aid mingling with Mother's blood on the floor and increased the size of the frightful red pool. We tried to stop the bleeding. It seemed a fruitless effort. We knew we would have to take her back to the hospital. Charles thought we could save some time by taking her in the runabout, Sharon Lee. When he tried to start the boat, he found the battery dead. There was nothing left to do but put Myrtle in a small rowboat with a little outboard engine to run the quarter mile to Collins Landing Dock. Mother was not really conscious and a dead weight to lift into the rowboat. Night shadows caught, cast their gloom upon us during our eerie ride up river to the landing. It seemed centuries to me before we finally made it. It certainly wasn't easy to transfer Myrtle from the boat to the station wagon seat. Chuck and I were so filled with anxiety over her worsening condition that it seemed forever to locate the doctor at the hospital. He searched her wound, saying she might need a transfusion the next day. They would keep her there and we should go home until tomorrow. Leaving mother in safe hands, we hurried as much as possible back to the island to reassure our waiting children. The transfusion wasn't a necessity, but Myrtle remained in the hospital for three days. Chuck, the children, and I would never forget that awful night, but not, mother could never recall anything about it. 
About a year after her mishap, mother began to expect an approaching illness. Sitting on the porch of the cottages, she asked me to promise not to send her to a nursing home. I really didn't realize it was the, to be her last summer at the island. Johnny was two years old when Mother Myrtle came to live with us at our home in the city. There were two teenagers, Kay and Steve, my brother, Clarence, four years younger than I, Charles and I. Mother made four generations, but we welcomed her with all our hearts. Myrtle lived with us a year, then left us from a massive stroke. The black threads of mourning were intertwined with the pink threads of her love for her always alive in our hearts.